بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الناونس بس للاودينس برضه عشان خاطر آه. اللي عايز اي سؤال يبقى على الشاتنج اه اه انا هنقولها على طول بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم آه كل سنه وحضراتكم طيبين يو ار اول ويلكم تو ذيس ميتنج ان جلوكوما كومبليكيشنز ويتش ويل بي هوستد باي باي بروفيسور دكتور طارق عيد بروفيسور اوف ثرمولوجي تانتا يونيفرستي and uh, Professor Mohammed Al-Malah, Ocala uh, Center, uh, Florida, USA, uh, consultant of glaucoma and cataract surgery, and me, Mohammed Mahdi. You are all welcome to participate in this meeting and to send a live chat and we'll collect the questions. And uh, we will answer all the questions once we will finish each presentation. After each presentation will be a, a period to take questions and to respond to the audience. Dr. Mohamed Malah, Fadl. Shukran. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Better to, to, to stop, uh, stop video for us. Okay, I, 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 I will get it. Yeah. Uh, I'm asking all the audience, could you please uh, stop all, all the mute yourself? And you can mute them. Yeah, of course. Okay, go ahead, Dr. Mohammed. Okay, good afternoon. It's 3.30 here in Florida. I know for many of the participants, it's already uh, 9.30 at night or uh, after Maghrib, but we're still, we're still fasting here in Florida. I want to talk to you today about uh, interoperative complications of mixed procedures, interoperative complications of minimally invasive glaucoma surgeries. This is a topic that I discussed with Dr. Mehdi, and we thought it may be of interest uh, to this audience. I am an, uh, an ophthalmologist in practice in Central Florida, in Ocala, Florida. Um, and uh, I've been practicing here for uh, over, over 10 years. Okay, so uh, as many of you, the audience knows, uh, mixed procedures or minim minimally invasive glaucoma surgeries are a group of surgical procedures uh, to lower intraocular pressure. Uh, they've really come into in development and into uh, significant usage uh, over the last um, 10 years, particularly over the last five years. And their claim to fame is we have a lower complication profile than traditional glaucoma surgery. MIGS procedures help to bridge the gap between using medications and laser trabeculoplasty. So patients who are not controlled in medications and laser trabeculoplasty, rather than going straight to a trabeculectomy or a tube, uh, MIGS procedures are supposed to fill a space between those two in that they uh, are more effective uh, than laser trabeculoplasty and medications, but don't carry the same complication profile as trabeculectomies and, and tubes. So um, we split the mixed procedures into uh, many different, different ways, many different categories that we can put them in. Um, but I like to think of them as anatomically uh, where, uh, where you're actually doing the surgery. So if we think about angle-based uh, surgeries, um, and this is going to be primarily the crux of my talk here. We're going to be talking mainly about complications of angle-based surgeries, but I just wanted to give a general overview for the audience. So in angle-based surgeries, you're doing the surgery in the angle. Um, you're, uh, I split this into two separate categories. So you have trabecular bypass procedures, uh, which do exactly what the name, name says. We're bypassing the trabecular meshwork. We're trying to get aqueous from the anterior chamber into Schlem's canal and bypassing the main site of resistance to uh, aqueous outflow. So under trabecular bypass procedures, um, you can do a trabecular bypass procedure uh, with a stent or without a stent. So um, if we're going to place a stent in the eye, uh, the first generation um, or the first device that was available for the space was the first generation eye stent. Uh, we also have the second generation eye stent or the eye stent inject, as well as now the hydrus device. These are all trabecular bypass devices. We can also bypass trabecular meshwork by doing a trabeculotomy or a goniotomy. And these include the excisional uh, dual blade goniotomy or the Kahook dual blade from New World Medical 
the trabectone procedure, the GAT 360 procedure, or the Omni procedure. So those are the trabecular bypass procedures. Within angle-based surgeries, we can also do um, canaloplasty. And canaloplasty can be done uh, as an abinternal procedure, such as the ABIC procedure, abinternal canaloplasty. It can also be done using the Omni device. And with both these procedures or devices, what we're doing is we're injecting viscoelastic into Schlem's canal and ballooning or opening up Schlem's canal and hopefully also removing any debris from Schlem's canal as well as perhaps in the collector channels and the more distal um, outflow system. I include the hydrous device uh, in canal plasty as well because part of the mechanism of the hydrous device is that it does stent open Schlem's canal. So those are, that's really the bulk of, um, of angle-based, uh, of, of mixed procedures are angle-based procedures. Obviously, we also have subconjunctival procedures, uh, including the Zen uh, stent. Subconjunctival procedures are different in that you're shifting the aqueous, rather in using the natural outflow system, you're actually creating a, a passageway uh, from the anterior chamber into the subconjunctival space. So in this space, we have the Zen uh, device as well as the micro, micro shunt from Santin, which is still not available in the US. We also have procedures to decrease inflow of aqueous humor uh, into the anterior chamber, uh, cyclophotocoagulation procedures such as endocyclophotocoagulation and micropulse photocoagulation. And we also have supraciliary procedures although none of these devices are currently on the market. So as I said, we're gonna focus this talk mainly on complications of angle-based uh, procedures. Okay, we're gonna talk about intraoperative complications, complications during surgery. We're gonna start out talking about the most common complications to then those that are less, less common, more rare. As you think of questions or things come up, please just add, type in the questions in the, in the chat box and uh, we will have some time to address those. So the most um, common thing, especially when you're starting out doing angle surgery, is really poor visualization. It's hard to see the angle if you're not used to using a gonial lens and looking, and, and looking at the angle under direct visualization. So whenever you're trying to look at the angle, you don't have a good view, um, there's a few steps to think about, a few things to consider. Number one, are you looking at the appropriate angle? Um, are you looking at from, a pro from, from the appropriate angle? The microscope should be tilted 35 degrees, and the patient's head should be tilted away from you 35 degrees uh, to give you a prospect angle of about 70 degrees or so. So you want to make sure that you're looking from the proper angle and you've tilted your microscope enough. Another uh, common issue initially when you're starting out with these procedures is inadequate magnification. Uh, really, you want to be able to zoom in and you really want to be able to see exactly what you're doing. Uh, after about my first 20 uh, eye stand cases, I went to a meeting with other surgeons and I realized that I hadn't been magnifying or zooming in enough when I was doing these procedures. You also want to increase the illumination uh, as well of the scope more than what you normally have. It's also important to maintain the proper uh, inflation in the anterior chamber. If the anterior chamber is underinflated, if you don't have enough viscoelastic in the anterior chamber, you're going to get corneal striae. If you apply too much pressure on the corneal lens, you're also going to get corneal striae. These striae in the cornea will impair your view and make it more difficult to see what's going on. So right off the bat, you know, that's the most common thing. It's not really a complication, but it can certainly make your surgery complicated to do if you don't have an adequate view and you can't properly see what it is you're doing. So I'd say <clears throat> after this, the most common issue you're going to find when you're doing angle surgery is bleeding. Uh, bleeding comes because of several things. Uh, number one, uh, the tissue itself is vascular. So just touching the trabecular meshwork can cause oozing of blood. Second, when you're creating a bypass or you're um, uh, bypassing the trabecular meshwork, then you have a direct communication into Schlem's canal and then through that into the collective channels. And if the pressure inside the anterior chamber is lower than the episcleral venous pressure, you will naturally get reflux of blood into the anterior chamber. This is not a complication, but it can impair your view 
and prevent you from completing the surgery if you don't deal with it adequately and properly. So these are the two mechanisms. Uh, these are two of the mechanisms. Number one, just trauma to the, to the trabecular meshwork and reflux into the anterior chamber. And these are usually pretty easy to deal with. You just get oozing of blood into the anterior chamber. Something that happens uh, significantly less commonly and is quite rare is to actually hit an aberrant arterial vessel. Uh, you know, I've, I've, this has happened to me probably uh, three times in my career. And it is, you know, whenever it happens, you really realize that uh, this is different from the other types of bleeding that you have. Um, I'm not sure why uh, some patients have this anatomy, uh, and I'll show a video of this as well. Uh, it's quite possible that this bleeding comes from uh, aberrant vessels of the iris arcade. This is a rare complication, but I'll show you a video of that as well. So when you get bleeding, what, what do you do? First of all, it's nothing, it's, it's uh, something that you should expect and you should plan for, and so you should be well prepared for it. When you manage bleeding or if blood is obscuring your view of what you're trying to do, simply place more viscoelastic to push the blood out of the way. If that's not enough, then repeat it. Uh, typically, viscoelastic alone, injecting viscoelastic alone should be sufficient about 95% of the time to clear the view. If you have a lot of blood and you're finding that you're injecting viscoelastic and you're still not getting a good view, then at that point in time, you can use the irrigation aspiration handpiece uh, from your FACO machine to remove the heme. Then you can inject more viscoelastic and resume your procedure. So I just want to show uh, a few videos, just examples of how you uh, go about just using the viscoelastic to push heme out of the way. And here you see we're looking under direct gonioscopic visualization at the anterior chamber angle. And we're simply, we have heme there, and we're simply injecting viscoelastic to push that heme out of the way. The last two are with eye stents. This is with a coke double goniotomy. We had some heme there. We couldn't see what we wanted to do. We cleared the heme out of the way. And then we can continue with the goniotomy uh, procedure. So pretty straightforward. You're doing the procedure. There's blood in the way. You can't see what you're doing. Stop, relax, remove your instrument, take the viscoelastic, inject it, and push the viscoelastic, push the heme out of the way, and you can then resume your procedure safely. Um, but I wanna show examples of what can happen rarely. Don't plan on this happening to you. This is a, a rare thing that can happen, but I want you to be able to, to recognize it when it happens, realize this is not normal, and you may have to do more to clear the blood out of the way. So this is, this is an ice tent procedure. Uh, that I did a few years ago. And you can see the eye stent went in nicely, but all of a sudden I'm getting all this blood, copious amounts of blood. So there's nothing, you know, I've, I think the eye stent went in properly, um, but I'm gonna have to clear all that blood out to see what's happening here. So I once again go, with, go in with viscoelastic, and I can see my eye stent, it seems to be in good position, but as I'm clearing this blood, you can see it's almost pulsatile. You can tell that that blood almost looks um, like it's arterial in nature because it, does, it is coming out in a pulsatile fashion. So if you look, um, you know, this is from the same video. If you look closely, you'll see before we even put in the eye stent, we have this one vessel here. And that was what was responsible for all that bleeding. This is an arterial vessel probably coming off of the uh, iris arcade. Uh, in any case, I've had that happen a few times. And when it does happen, it can be alarming but just you know, relax, uh, stop what you're doing, take the viscoelastic, inject it, and push the heme out of the way. Now this is, I think this is the same case, and you can see there's quite a bit of heme. So I was able, although the ice tent was out of the way, we still need to remove this heme, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna, we're gonna use the uh, irrigation aspiration probe to remove the rest of this uh, blood from the anterior chamber. I don't know what the video quality is like where you're watching, but you can tell that this is a, a multifocal patient. And so um, I want to just pause this video. Uh, and so, so with that, uh, you can see that even, even, you know, even though it was a multifocal patient, that patient still had a phenomenal outcome with that procedure. Just be careful, remove the heme. Uh, the next video I'm going to show is actually with a, a superciliary device that goes uh, into the superciliary space. Uh, this device is not on the market. Um, and I just want to go ahead and resume this video. Um, I just showing another way to clear uh, clear blood. You can get quite a bit of uh, bleeding when you go into the superciliary space. 
It is significantly more vascular than the anterior chamber angle. So I do what I normally do. I inject viscoelastic, but I'm not really getting anywhere. There's still a lot of blood. There's blood starting to come back and it's going in the interface between the lens and the cornea. And it's just not working out. So here I, 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 I've not completed the procedure yet, but I go in with the irrigation aspiration handpiece. I remove the blood from the anterior chamber that way. And then once I'm able to do that, then I'm able to, to resume and continue with the, with the surgery. So that's the same patient that's the view afterwards. You can see the blood has stopped and we're able to resume the procedure. Um, let's see here. Okay, so that's really how to deal with blood. Uh, I will say uh, another thing that can happen whenever you um, uh, you know, sometimes if you get a lot of bleeding and your irrigation aspiration is not sufficient to remove the blood, as it was in that example, uh, you can actually use, uh, sometimes have to resort to using a, a vitrector uh, to remove the, um, to remove the, uh, uh, the rest of the uh, heme. And that can be quite effective as well. Okay, so let's talk about uh, perhaps complications that are, that are less common, uh, but do happen. Uh, stent malposition. Um, sometimes, sometimes you can do a, uh, a procedure, place the stent in place, but it's not really where you intended it to be. This can happen a lot with the first generation eye stent not sitting properly in the trabecular meshwork. It can sometimes, you may have actually inadvertently placed it in the ciliary body face rather than in the trabecular meshwork. And um, I'll show another example of the eye stent inject as well. So if the eye stent's not sitting properly in the trabecular meshwork, and I'll show you some videos of this, basically you want to stop what you're doing, relax, be calm. You want to just grab the uh, eye stent injectory, grasp it, and pull back, and then replace it into the, um, into the uh, uh, Schlem's canal. If the eye stent's in a position where it shouldn't be, then you want to grasp the eye stent and then reinsert it. I just would like to ask the participants if you're uh, to go ahead and just everyone please uh, mute uh, your microphone so that everyone can hear. Um, <clears throat> with the eye stand inject, the second generation eye stand, uh, there's a whole host of issues, you know, other things that we could talk about as far as what can happen intraoperatively there. But one of the things that can happen sometimes is you can get a double insertion. Both stents actually insert simultaneously one on top of the other. And if we have time, I'll show you a video of that as well. <clears throat> with the Hydra's device, um, if you've had a chance to use this device, you'll note that oftentimes it goes in beautifully, but there are times where it wants to dive posteriorly and not remain in Schlem's canal. You, 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 you'll know when this is, happen when this is happening, because usually the patient will feel uh, pain with that. Um, <clears throat> just some tips for the Hydra's device, um, and we'll probably just skip over this um, unless someone has questions about it at the end. So we'll just go into this next video. And this is, these are videos showing um, basically eye stent, the first generation eye stent when it's not positioned properly. So you can see the eye stent there is not really uh, sitting where it needs to be, it's kind of sticking out. So you just pull it back, put it flush with the trabecular meshwork, and then reinsert again. And usually doing it that way, you'll get it to sit nice and flush. Uh, another example of the eye stent as well, <clears throat> Same thing. Uh, when it's not sitting improperly, you can see that one is definitely not sitting improperly. You just want to maneuver it uh, calmly and then put it into position and then slide it again, advance it forward. Um, this one, you can see that the eye stand uh, fell off the inserted prematurely. Once again, just re grasp. These are just examples of re grasping uh, the first generation eye stand in the anterior chamber. It should be a very controlled environment because you have viscoelastic in the anterior chamber. Uh, your wound should be competent and you should be able to re-grasp it, especially under high magnification from, uh, from your microscope. So once again, it's not sitting exactly the way I want it to sit. Uh, it's sitting uh, kind of out of the, out of, you know, you can see it's loose there. It's not properly secured. So we just pull it out, flatten it against Schlamps canal again, and then reinsert it. Very good. And this is another example of showing the same thing. <clears throat> so once again, it's not sitting properly. We grasp the snorkel of it, and then we just 
push it flush against the Schlems canal and then push it, push it in again. Um, more, another example of, uh, of malposition, it's too superficial here. We've got to make sure that it sits properly and really take the time uh, to make sure that it's sitting properly before you move on to the, to the rest of the case. Um, let's see here, I want to move on. I think this is the same video. Okay, so we talked about stent malposition and how to correct that. We talked about the eye stent inject. I'm sorry, the, the first generation eye stand, we really didn't talk about the hydrus uh, too much, uh, but I do have a video of the eye stand inject if other people would like to see that towards the end. So less common complications with, with excisional goniotomy, sometimes you can get a cyclodialysis cleft. This is not typical, but you, as you're doing the procedure, you'll see the iris fall back and you'll see a space open up the cyclodialysis cleft uh, and you'll see that happen as you incise with the hook dual blade. This may be related to pulling on the tissue rather than using the blades to cut the tissue. So you really, when you see this happen, you want to stop what you're doing. You can either reverse direction or cut further down the rectal meshwork. But you really uh, want to make sure that you have a good view, you have good control of the situation. So you can actually see the tissue tent up with the blade and you can see those two blades on the side incise and cut the tissue. If you do get a cyclodialysis cleft, then initially your pressure is going to be quite low. Even though you may get some blood in the anterior chamber and you want to think it's going to be high the next day, it'll probably be low the next day. But you want to make sure you follow these patients closely. Uh, I found very uh, severe intraocular pressure spikes, so very high elevated pressure, very elevated pressure about five to seven days after the procedure, anytime really within the first two weeks. But I usually see these patients, I want to see them post up day one and then post-op day within the five to six or seven day period. Another thing that can happen is you can get a decimase tear, and I'll show some examples of that. If you see a decimase tear, stop what you're doing. Uh, typically, they're small and usually inconsequential uh, if you stop it in time. So this is an example. This, is, this shows you a decimase tear here with the, with the eye stand. I was putting in the eye stand. You can see there was uh, some movement here. Unfortunately, that ref reflex is in the way. But you can see here as I'm putting it in, there was a jerking movement, and you can see that we actually pulled some of Decimase membrane off. And you can see I'm wondering what's going on here. I'm kind of pushing it, and I realize that I've got a Decimase tear, but nonetheless, I still have a good view. So I go ahead and proceed and, and, place, uh, and place the eye stand. And then you can see here after the cataract is removed, you can see there's the, uh, the decimase tear. I inject some discal elastic uh, just to kind of assess where, how big it is. And thankfully, it's quite peripheral. And these are almost always, I've never had one that was uh, central. They're almost, almost always peripheral when they happen. And you can see the decimase tear kind of just uh, floating around in there uh, right, here, right over here as, the, the, as there's movement in the, uh, of the fluid in the anterior chamber. So you can get a decimase tear, usually they're inconsequential and really not a big deal. Um, this is an example of uh, something similar happening with uh, the uh, Coke dual blade. You can see that I'm moving along. You can see that I'm actually kind of torquing the eye. And then all of a sudden when that torque is released, the eye moves back and something happened here. I'm not entirely sure, so we've got to explore what's happening here. I see a lot of blood, but then you can also see that there's this membrane here. And so I'm going to go in with viscoelastic just to see what's going on here. <clears throat> and as I push the viscoelastic, you can see that there is a, you know, as I eject this glass, you can see that there's a cyclodialysis cleft there. You can see a little bit of a space forming. And you can see that it also involves um, that's maze membrane. So I can see that I've gotten a tear there. And what I do here is I basically just reapproximate the tissue and reapproximate the anatomy uh, with viscoelastic. Um, so really, the decimase tear is, is not really a consequence here, but the cyclodialysis cleft can cause you to have very low pressures initially, and then can cause you to have a pressure spike. So that's something that we want to be uh, aware of and cognizant of. So. That is that. Um, that's really about it for the presentation. 
Uh, I wanted to, uh, if people are interested later, I can show you the video of how to deal with the eye stent uh, inject um, double implantation. I have that video ready for you as well. You, so can, you can proceed, Dr. Muhammad. Dr. Muhammad. Okay. All right. You can All proceed right. with this video now, no problem. You can go okay. ahead. Let me show you that video. This is the eye stand inject, and this has two stents on it. And what you can tell in this one is basically I have the one, or what I've done is I've injected it, and I looked at my device, and I see that there's only one, there, there's, there is no more eye stand on there. So that means both devices went in at the same time. So I see one that's kind of loose there, and I pick it up again with the inserter. I activate it, I push on the button, and that pushes the device, that one stent, the eye stent inject, into the proper position. So what happened to the other one? So the other one, it must be there. So I go in with an MVR blade, and I open up the TM to see it, because I know that's kind of where it should be. And as I open up the TM, you can see that the um, first eye stent inject is in there, and it's buried. So this is a useful technique. If you ever get in a situation, you know, only one of them should come out at a time when you push the button. But I have had it where two of them come out at a time. It's happened to me at least twice. And so you can just leave it in there deep. It's inert. It's not going to really irritate anything. But if you would like to get some function from that one eye stent, then you can go ahead and open up the, the inside the trabecular meshwork and, and expose that other stent so you can have both um, stents exposed. So uh, that's really it. That's all I had prepared, and I'm happy to uh, take questions about intraoperative uh, complications that can arise with mixed procedures. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Dr. Mohamed Malah. You are most welcome. It was a nice presentation. Uh, now we can uh, take uh, very few questions from the audience on the chat. If anyone has any question for Dr. Malah, you could write down, and we will uh, ask him to, uh, to do. We have we have a hand uh, raised from uh, hand. Okay, you could collect the hair from hand. You see hair. If you see hair, just uh, let hair end. Assalamu alaikum. Good evening. Uh, thank you for Dr. Uh, Mohamed Mahdi and Dr. Tariq Aida for uh, this uh, nice uh, presentation uh, or collecting uh, us with Dr. Mohamed al Malah. Uh, actually, I have uh, two questions. Uh, the first one about uh, mixed with a trap, subscribe trap click to me. Uh, some surgeons put, uh, I think, eye stent uh, in sclerostomy from uh, anterior chamber uh, to uh, under subscleral uh, flap. Uh, uh, what's your uh, experience in this uh, situation? Second question, uh, uh, I just heard about uh, uh, modulations of the uh, treatment of the glaucoma from medical, uh, as first line, from medical therapy to laser trabeculoplasty. Um, I think there is a, a randomized uh, controlled trials, uh, large uh, published about uh, that. Uh, I ask about it. it really works. Thank you. So uh, let me address the second question first. Uh, I think the second question is looking at um, the results of the trial that was published last year, uh, looking at SLT versus medical therapy. Uh, if that, am, I, am I understanding your question correctly? Uh, SLT versus medical therapy. Uh, that trial showed uh, that basically roughly they were equivalent. Uh, and showed that uh, SLT was just as effective as medical therapy for first line therapy, uh, and also the patients with uh, who had gotten SLT were uh, there was a suggestion that they may be less likely to progress than patients on medical therapy. Uh, they also had a cost benefit in that overall uh, there was less cost to the system in the NHS if patients got SLT as opposed to getting medical therapy. In my personal experience, I do use SLT or selective laser trabeculoplasty quite often. I offer it as first-line therapy to patients. Uh, some patients are reluctant to have laser, um, but for those patients who do, I certainly offer uh, selective laser trabeculoplasty as first-line therapy. Uh, it, is effect it is an effective procedure. I treat at 360 degrees of the angle. I do use a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, uh, an NSAID, uh, for four days afterwards. Um, 
I didn't used to do that in the past. There was one paper that showed that perhaps if you use an NSAID or a steroid afterwards, that there was lower intraocular pressure 12 weeks out. Um, and that's just based on one trial. So based on that, I've changed my, my pattern. So yes, I do think SLT is effective. Um, the first question you had was about, um, I think using an eye stent at the same time as a trabeculectomy. Um, I have not done that and I don't have any experience with that. I'd like to learn more about it. I really have not done uh, the eye stent at the same time as trabeculectomy. I've, you may be, maybe you're referring to the express shunt. I do the express shunt quite a bit uh, with the same time as trabeculectomy. So underneath this floral flap, I'll place an express shunt, and that is something that is common. And uh, some surgeons will say that that's, that does make the procedure more uh, predictable, less risk of hypotony. Uh, the one study that looked at it in large numbers found really no difference between using an express shunt, between using an express shunt and regular trabeculectomy, other than that uh, patients who had an express shunt had quicker visual recovery than patients who had a trabeculectomy. That may be important in patients, uh, for example, who are monocular. Um, patients who are still working who need quick visual recovery. Uh, I saw Dr. Dr. Malah, we have another question from the audience about the IOP spikes with Cahog bleed. Um, what causes and how to treat? Okay, so with the hook dual blade, uh, almost always uh, you have uh, low pressure the first day, uh, but within the first week or two, you can have a pressure spike. And if you look at your data, you'll find that it happens in, it can happen in 15% of patients, maybe even 20% of patients. And initially, uh, we saw this, I saw this quite a bit because I would do the surgery. Obviously, these patients all have glaucoma. That's why we're doing a, a goniotomy procedure. So they're more likely to have pressure spikes with cataract surgery anyway. So I would do the procedure. I would also stop all their glaucoma medications and I'd put them on a steroid. So you've done a procedure, you've uh, put them on a steroid, which can raise the pressure, and you've taken away their glaucoma medications. Um, and for all those reasons, you're going to get pressure spikes. So my protocol now is I have the patients on the day of surgery, they stop their medications, their glaucoma medications. I assess them on post-op day one. If their pressure is more than 10, I restart at least one glaucoma medication in anticipation for the pressure spike that, that may happen. I've also switched from using a strong steroid such as Durazol, and I use uh, prednisolone and acetate instead, and I found less pressure spikes that way. Um, so the way to, you're gonna still have pressure spikes with the hook dual blade. I'd say my incidence of pressure spikes is probably less than 5%, but these are patients that you should see at five to seven days. Dr. Malah, are you mm -hmm. finished? Yes. Uh, I have questions. What are the major differences between uh, eye stent and eye stent inject? And how many can you inject uh, at a time? And the third question is, how much pressure are you going to reduce? Is it related to the number of injectable eye stents you do? Or, or one or two is the, is the same results? So there are several studies that have shown that if you place more stents, you're more likely to get a, uh, a lower pressure. Uh, the biggest difference between the eye stent and the eye stent inject is with the eye stent inject, you can place two stents. Because of government, because of regulations in the US and because of the way we are paid to do surgery and the way we're reimbursed and the way the hospitals are reimbursed, the eye stent is only approved for single injection. Now that's not the case in other countries. And so you can use the first generation eye stent and you can place multiple, multiple of the first generation eye stents. I don't, I'm not sure, have anyone shown there's any difference between using the first generation eye stent, you know, multiple eye stents, versus the second generation eye stent inject? In the U.S., the advantage for us is that we, if you use the eye stent inject, you can put in two stents, as opposed to with the eye stent, you can only put in one stent. The theory is, if you're putting in more than one stent, then you're more likely to get be close to a collector channel, and more likely to improve outflow of fluid. Uh, as far as uh, intraocular pressure lowering. I only use the eye stent and eye stent inject in patients where the primary indication for surgery is cataract surgery. They're only approved for use in conjunction with cataract surgery. So if my primary indication for surgery is to lower the intraocular pressure, I'm going to probably go with a different procedure, whether it's a hydrus, whether it's a, a excisional goniotomy. But if my, my primary indication for surgery is to remove the cataract and I simply want to reduce a patient's medication dependence, 
then the eye stand or the eye stand inject is a good option for that because they're the ones that you're least likely going to have issues with. You're least likely going to have bleeding with or have any other issue with. Once you've done about 15 or 20 of them, you'll find that they are relatively straightforward to place. Uh, and those are things, patients, that you don't have to worry about um, really too much postoperatively. Um, so the efficacy, I, I would say, anecdotally, my for me, I think... Uh, you know, there is efficacy with the eye stand inject. That's why I do them. I don't think it's efficacious as is doing uh, a goniotomy procedure or, or a hydrus procedure. But I think it is less, um, less uh, uh, trouble with bleeding uh, intraoperatively. Can you use I another, it? I have another question, please, Dr. Bellah, from the audience sure. about uh, use of MIGS and uveated glaucoma. And uveated glaucoma. Um, yeah, do you have your experience in that? Would you recommend it? Or? I do. Um, uh, uveated glaucomas are, uh, in general, obviously, uh, can be some of the more difficult glaucomas to take care of. Uh, I have done uh, um, hooked oblique goniotomies in some uveated patients. I've done uh, SIPAS, uh, I think, in at least one uveated patient. Um, in my experience with mixed procedures, I can't say that I have a great experience with mixed procedures uh, in this in uveitic patients. Um, <coughs> when it comes to uveitic patients, I think probably I would more favor, uh, and the pressures on control, I would more favor a tube um, if, the, if, if, if it's warranted. But I have done, in patients where it's milder glaucoma, I have done goniotomies and I've had some success with that. Okay. I'd like to thank you, Dr. Mullah, very much for your presentations and for the discussion. And I'd right. like to present now Dr. Muhammad Mahdi, who's going to talk to us about the uh, functioning and the dysfunctioning blip. Dr. Okay. Muhammad, you are ready? Till I am ready, I'm asking Dr. Mullah just a question here for, the, for myself and for the audience as well. Is Do you recommend doing uh, this uh, micro, uh, micro stent? Inge uh, eye stent inject as a primary glaucoma surgery in high pressure glaucomas, 30s and something like this alone, or you are using it con if you are doing a concomitant cataract and uh, mix injection? I only do it uh, with concomitant cataract. Yeah. So if I'm doing a standalone procedure for high pressure, I found the uh, goniotomy procedure to be quite effective for that. So for that, I use a hook dual blade procedure. Thank you. Okay. So I have to go uh, back to this once. <laughs> now, uh, I'm going to talk about this functioning filtering blip, which is a very important topic that we have to know. Uh, successful filtering blip should be characterized being elevated, diffuse, quiet, with microcystic formation and interocular pressure within the appropriate range. By appropriate range, I mean it's not elevated or hypotonous. Here we can see very few live photos for the elevated blip and the quiet and diffuse blip. And the other one is the microcystic one. And you can see it here in the videos that I'm displaying, that is playing right now. You can clearly see the conjunctiva under it, uh, the, sorry, the sclera through the conjunctiva and see microcystic spaces in the conjunctiva. For this successful blip, some of the Rostock module of the Heidelberg uh, tomography has imaged the epithelium and the subconjunctival epithelium in this plebs and try to classify them according to the function into fair grades as you can see here according to the number of vacuoles and the size of the vacuole and classify this one as grade one this a and b grade two and three and four with four is the most successful and you could see here how how is the subconjunctival connective tissue is sparse and widely spaced if you injected mitomycin or used mitomycin during the filtering surgery, you could see that you, we have a mega vacuoles inside the, the, the epithelial cells and you found that 
the subconjunctival spaces are more widely spaced as well, more than the other ones. If we apply this, it, you, we, can, we can classify the functioning blip according to a measurable uh, machine. What are the signs of failing blip? Failing blip is injected vascularized, thickened, localized, high dome, the blip, or insisted blip with low or high intraocular pressure. I mean by low and high because most of us, when we are talking about dysfunction filtering, filtering blip, we go to the high pressure one. And the, but the low pressure one is the most precious for us because it leads to immediate loss of vision. We can see here that a sign of failure is injection, as you can see, vascularization, thickening and localization, as you can see here, you could clearly see the margin. And sometimes you could see what we call high domed or tenon cyst. If, if you use the imaging system that you are using, earlier the Rostock module of the Heidelberg, you could see how intact and compact is the epithelial cells of the conjunctiva and the cornea adjacent to it. You know, this is very tight and you hardly see any vacuole and if you have seen it, it's very small. If you image the subconjunctival spaces, you found that it is very, very dense connective tissue and very dense and connective tissue is completely packed and you st still see there's some con subconjunctival blood vessels as you can see here in the last image as you can see is our for the failing blip classification we have two two main blips one is the one with the high intraocular pressure and the other one with the low intraocular pressure if we went to the one with the high intraocular pressure is the one we have two categories, one with a low localized blip and the other one is the one with high pressure and the high domed blip. The high domed blip usually encapsulated blip and tenon cyst, while the low localized blip is the blip that is flat and it is due to subconjunctive fibrosis due to external, uh, external occlusion or obstruction of the sclerectomy site internally. And we'll come to the, to the causes of this later on. For the low blip, uh, low interocular pressure failing blips, we have two blips. Low blips due to leakage and conjunctive and buckle holding. And elevated blips with diffuse, which is diffuse due to overfiltration and accompanied by hypotony as well. Uh, if we go to the cause of hypotony, either we have increased the aqueous outflow or decreased the aqueous production. Decreased the aqueous production is very important and we have to pay attention to the you in, uh, in advertent use of the echo suppressant, which had not been stopped before surgery or continued to be used by the patient without being uh, uh, telling the surgeon, and also the celiorethral attachment and the inflammation that could happen with these operations. Ciliary shutdown is a very important category of this patient, which could happen especially with the use of mitomycin and antimetabolites. Increased aqueous outflow could be due to excessive filtration, with, which occurs use, uh, happen with full sickness and the use of antimetabolites or the white, white sclerectomy sites or blip leakage and the conjunctival button holding or cyclodes cleft and correct detachment. If we come here, to the clinical finding, it depends on the mechanism responsible for hypotony. We have to assess the anterior chamber depths and to classify the anterior chamber depths according to the central depths and the peripheral depths. Here's grade one, where this little I read you call near touch in the periphery while some of the periphery is still open and the center is still wide. While in grade two, it is complete iridocorneal touch without lenticular touch. And grade three, complete iridocorneal uh, lenticular touch, which is very hard to see. Uh, and also we have to assess the blip height is, is high or low. And then to assess the conjunctiva for button holding and leakage and to do sidle test with the sterile fluorescent straps and to do fundus exam to assess the macula and to see if there's any uh, hypotony maculopathy and choroidal falls or uh, choroidal effusion or choroidal attachment. You can see here the macular fault, which is nearly untreatable. 
I have encountered with such a case, but it was very early, not more than one day. And immediately I went to the operation and I increased the, the pressure. And luckily I, I was completely lucky with this patient that it went away. And we could also de, uh, do uh, uh, OCT for this patient to see the corrugations in the macular area, as you can see here. Uh, we, we have a, a plan here. You can work with it. If we, ha we have to assess the intraocular pressure postoperatively, it's either low or high. For low intraocular pressure, it's either we have to assess the anterior chamber depth. Is it flat AC or deep AC? If it is flat AC, we do sidle test. If it's sidle test positive, this means that we have conjunctival buttonholing, leaking, uh, and uh, some damage to the, the scleral flap. If we have a negative sidle test, we have to do fundoscopy and to look for the choroidal effusion. And uh, if we have a low interocular pressure with deep AC and the blip is high, we have usually overfiltration and hypotomaculopathy, which could occur. If we have a high interocular pressure, we have to assess the depth of the anterior chamber. Either we have an anterior chamber deep, uh, deep AC, we go to gonioscopy and see if we have blocking of the internal ostium or open the internal ostium. If we have blocked internal ostium by root of the iris or remnant of the iridectomy mm -hmm. or some fibrinous exudate or some of the, the, uh, non, in, the intact, some is uh, in scleral fibers or some vitreous or whatever, we have to, we can solve this problem early by uh, gonio puncture. Or we have an open ostium, this means that the occlusion is in the, under the flap or under the conjunctive. If we have a flat AC with increased interocular pressure, we look for the depths. Is it deep and two chamber? We have a choroidal, we have sobrachoroidal hemorrhage sometimes. Uh, if we have the same depths as this echoes misdirection or subacoridal hemorrhage. Uh, how to manage these cases? A case of hypotony is a very important case that we have to take care of it. Uh, I, we have two main categories and one in between. The most important two categories is, is the one which is mild and we can observe. Observation and Conservative management is indicated in overfiltration with formed AC with elevated blip, I mean AC grade one. We have to restrict activity and complete bed rest, avoid weight lifting, constipation, vigorous coughing, sneezing, and blowing the nose, and some sort of this. And we could also do a tight bandage. Okay. Uh, if the, the cases that we need in immediate intervention is that the cases with flat AC with lenticular corneal touch, I mean grade C AC. External tamponade is not successful in this case at all. Immediate reformation of the anterior chamber with air, PSS, viscoelastics, and carbon sulfur hexafluoride could be employed because we have to leave out the contact between the lens and the cornea to avoid damage for both the cornea and the lens as well. Sclerotomy with drainage of the supracoridal effusion might be necessary in, in these cases. Uh, Overfiltration management of persistent hypotony. We could, if we have overfiltration with persistent hypotony, either do bandage contact lens, and the bandage contact lens is not the contact lens that we are using here. It should be a, a wide lens, 17 to 20 millimeter and is applied for five days, not only for one day, and we can see it every now and then. Or Simon Shell, I have not seen, but I collected from the literature, and we could apply cryo for these cases or use argon laser with enhancement of the conjunctiva with mesilin blue or rose bengal, and use both size of 200 to 500 micron, uh, duration of 0.2 seconds, and the power is between 300 and 500 milliwatts. Shrinkage of the conjunctiva is the end point for the treatment. We have to shrink the conjunctiva. Or we use a neodymium mag laser to the conjunctival epithelium, or either to do puncture of the subconjunctival blood vessel and to induce bleeding, which will induce fibrosis later on. Or we inject autolysis blood from the patient himself, 0.1 to 0.2 milliliter, injected to the center of the blip, and it will, it will be seen in the next video later on. Here is the, is the, is the 
Bandage contact lens, and uh, here, uh, uh, sorry, this is the Simon shell, and here's the cryo applied to the lab, and here the results of the autologous blood injection. Autologous blood injection, 0.1 to 0.2 milliliter, injected to the center of the lab, and we can see it here, this technique in, the, in this video. We have to reform the anterior chamber. There are two things that has to be avoided here. We have to elevate the pressure inside the eye to avoid entrance of the blood inside the eye, inside the anterior chamber, by injection of viscoelastic through the sideboard, then later on we leave it. Then we use an insulin series to inject the fresh blood from the own patient and inject 0.1 to 0.2 milliliter uh, above the scleral flap under the conjunctiva away from the ostium and do inject it very slowly and then when we complete it as you can see here we can remove the viscoelastic and after be sure that there's no blood enter the eye mm -hmm. okay management of, the, of a leaking blab also all measures described above under overfiltration, then you could use fibrin tissue glow or autologous, the autologous or the commercially available ones, thrombin fibrinogen, thrombin system, or we use serenium acrylate glow, which is a commercially available one. I have seen the Indians are using some of it, but this needs you uh, to be completely dry and to apply contact lens later on on it or do surgical repair with flesh conjunctival conjunct lab or amniotic membrane graft. Here's the application of the cyanoacrylate glue, and here you will see two videos for two cases of uh, surgical repair of the uh, leaking blip. Here it was a leaking blip due to the ends of the 9-0 uh, nylons projecting through the conjunctiva, which made the failure of the conjunctiva. You completely dissect it and remove the debicilize this area. Then, what this, the other one, we do the section and removal of the non-healthy conjunctiva and put the amniotic membrane here, then suture the, the conjunctiva to the limbus securely. When we are doing the section in the one to the left here, we can enhance the section with the use of a uh, subconjunctival injection of xylocaine with adrenaline. And then to suture the conjunctiva into the limbus with a uh, tin O vicryl or tin, tin O nylon. Here we do advancement of the conjunctiva, the sect as far posteriorly as possible without injury. And take care here if you are working superiorly, that you are working superior, near to the superior, uh, the, eleva the elevators of the eye. And you do complete homestasis, then you secure the conjunctiva as you can see here. I, here I would like to thank Dr. Tarek because he, I, I, this video was missing and I got his two videos as you can, these two videos from here as well. Uh, failing or failed blip with high intraocular pressure is the next topic. W low localized blip, usually early failure due to subconjunctival and deep scale fibrosis or tight scleral flap. This external closure. Obstruction of the sclerectomy site due to internal closure, uh, either due to presence of blood clot because of bleeding during surgery, fibrin, vitreous, if there's vitreous loss, iris tissue, or dismiss membrane. Uh, in a high dome deblep, usually late failure, not early like the other two cases, and it is either the encapsulated blip or the tenon cyst. Early, if you see in this diagram, early we have either blockage at the, the level of the intrascleral under the bed of the scleral flap or suprascleral between the conjunctiva and the, uh, the, uh, fl the scleral flap. Uh, late, you have either excessive fibrosis uh, above the, the sclera or you have encapsulation of the cyst. Uh, we should know a little bit about the pharmacology and the pathology of what is happening 
in the wound healing in order to be able to attack at each phase with the necessary drug or complication. Post operative wound healing, we should understand tissue injuries provoke blood and the plasma proteins, which formation of clot, leukocytic infiltration and inflammation, followed by local fibros fibrocyte transformation into fibroblast. Both fibroblast proliferation and fibroblast migration occurs during the first two weeks, and this can be attacked with either mitomycin C or 5 fluorescent injection. Collagen deposition, contraction, loss of cellularity, and remodeling and development of new vessels developed later on or months after surgery. And this is not possible to attack with mitomycin or 5 fluorescent alone, and we have to interfere surgically in this case. Uh, if we have to manage the early failing blip, with inadequate interocular pressure control during the first months postoperatively, we can modulate this wound healing with so many options. One of them is topical steroids that to be tapered six to eight weeks. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory has no effect and has an adverse effect even. Systemic and subconjunctival steroids has little effect except in EVT cases only. So don't go to this. You modulate your wound healing and watch up with the topical steroid. Or use anti-metabolites like mitomycin C and the 5 uracil with the specific regimen described for post operative use. Mitomycin C usually is reserved for interoperative complication due to more yeah complications that could happen post-operatively. Also, mitomycin C could be used post-operatively with lidocaine, with epinephrine, 0.05 milliliter of mitomycin C, 0.2 milligram per milliliter, is added to 0.1 milliliter, uh, so a total amount of 0.15 uh, milliliter injected subconjunctively uh, away from the, con this away from the edges of the uh, trap uh, post operatively. Or we can resort to using 5 fluorescein that could be used post operatively in a dosage of 5 milligram per dose every other day and could be spaced more with more days for a total dose of 15 to 50 milligrams over two to, to three weeks. Uh, digital focal massage could be employed and usually I started with what during the phase of modulation of the wound healing with topical steroid, I result topical uh, uh, digital massage uh, and use intermittent uh, pressure five to ten seconds. Uh, I, usually is the opposite to the sclerotomy wound, but I usually do it at the edges of the wound to make it a little bit displaced, repeated if successful, and add steroids at this stage. How do you know that it is successful? If you do massage alone, the intraocular pressure will be decreased like by, by this intermittent pressure. But successful massage means that the intraocular pressure is low and the blip get higher. If the blip is not getting high, this is not successful and don't repeat it. And if it is, it is successful, you should teach it to the patient and ask him to do it at home. Or resort to suture lysis in a stepwise manner, one suture per set, and if it is the suture is removed, is one suture is removed, you do digital massage, elevate the blip, the blip, then ask the patient to wait for one hour, assess the depth of the anterior chamber, and assess the blip height, and check if there's no complication happened. And if the, you need more pressure down, you could release another suture, but you keep the sutures to be removed wide apart from each other, or employ a releasable suture. I usually do uh, this releasable suture early and remove it early post-operative. And then after the removal of the releasable suture, within the first few days, uh, I do digital massage, which is successful in most of cases to avoid early uh, high bottom. Uh, or we can use tissue plasminogen activator if intracamerally if there is fibrinous exposure. Uh, laser internal regression with the laser or gonopuncture. If you have closure of the internal ostium, uh, here the, the digital massage is applied with the cotton uh, buds, and here the table uh, uh, blip is elevated as you can see here. Uh, 
Deep filling blip with internal division, we can do YAG laser, power 3.5 to 8.5 millijoule, three bulbs per burst, followed by digital massage. All the surgical procedures that we do should be, should be followed by digital massage to facilitate the aqueous drainage under the conjunctiva. So aqueous by itself is antifibrotic. External ah. with needling, uh, I, we, we can use 27 to 30 gauge needle, five to eight milli millimeter from the scleral flap edge with, uh, and with BSS and xylocaine is injected to facilitate movement. A sweeping movement to release the fibrosis could be employed. Uh, also, whole could laser be, could be used. Here's a, a case of needling that I did it a few years back. It was a case of uh, iris dysplasia in an adult patient, second glaucoma, which had failed after a few months. I'm introducing the needle here and I'm touching the conjunctiva and holding it away from the edge of the scleral flap five to, to eight or six to eight millimeter. I, I do to and fro movement to pierce the conjunctiva and the edges of the sclera. Then once I have this egress of fluid, because I open the edge of the, the, the conjunctiva, the, uh, the conjunctival cyst and the sclera, the trap, I start to do sweeping movement to make the opening wide. Then I resort to doing the same in the other direction from the nasal side, as you can see here. Then I employed doing the digital massage. Then after this one, I injected five milligram of uh, five fluid cell, one clock hour from each other, from the scleral flap, uh, when the blip formation was observed during the needling. If no blip formation occurred in this study, Five fluid cell was injected subconjunctively over the scleral flap. Usually, it's recommended to inject the scleral, the five fluid cell away from the uh, scleral flap. I don't know why it is completely closed, but I, I I did this in my study, and we can see here. Here is the site of injection of the uh, the direction of injection, and the sites of injection of the five fluid cell both operatively and to watch for the complications. Uh, and this was the result of the study. The pressure, the mean pressure was reduced from about 29 millimeter mercury to about 16 millimeter mercury, which was completely uh, successful. Of course, you should know that all the patients don't behave the same, as you can see. This procedure is a surgical maneuver, which is simple, but it is not complication free. This is a range of complication you could be encountered. Hyphema could happen. Subconjunctival hemorrhage is usual. So avoid hitting the uh, uh, subconjunctival blood vessels. Hypotony and choroidal effusion could happen. And it happened in one of my cases. Needle tract leak, like conjunctival button holding or superficial banquet keratitis from the use of the 5 fluid cell and the epithelial defect in the cornea and the conjunctiva from the 5 fluid cell. Here, this is another maneuver. If you are going to do cataract surgery and you have a failed new filtering blab, after completion of the cataract surgery, I try to open the scleral flap from inside by going through the internal ostium and injecting viscoelastic, but it was not successful because the cause of, the cause of uh, failure here was not only closure of the internal ostium, but the internal ostium was closed secondary to closure of the scleral bed because of tight closure. Then I injected the IOL and under Helon, uh, I I went to superficial needling of the subconjunctival space and I cut the one of the sutures. Then I will elevate the edges of the flap, as you can see here. I cut the suture now. 
then I'm going to elevate the edges of the flap also through the same entry. You see here, the flap is elevated. And you should tint it a little bit with the tip of the needle, as you can see it here. It is tinted, and you can go through the internal ostium because this is sort of fake. If it is fake, it is impossible and prohibited to go inside. Then I closed the wound and during removal of the viscoelastic, I went with the tip of the infusion cannula here through the internal ostium and you could see here that the blip is formed and the conjunctiva is ballooned. This is another, this is another effect of uh, revision, and I thank you very much for being patient, listening to these hard talks. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Muhammad. Uh, we have a question from the audience yeah. about subscleral flap needling. Yeah. Works well. Yeah. What What was the question now? Um, can you can you stop sharing your video, please, Dr. Muhammad? Okay. Yes, I stopped. Okay. The question is: Subscleral flap needling works well. Um, Abigent eye drops to enhance conjunctival fibrosis. So, if you have an experience in that, abigent uh, eye drops. Uh, uh, again, could you please ask the question back? Um, uh, the question is subscleral flab needling. Yeah. Does it work well? Sure, if you did it well in and your hand, in time. And how yeah. it works. Yeah, uh, it works well if you uh, look. Early, you are not in need for this one except to do needling and cutting of the suture. It is a kind of suture lysis. Later on, before complete closure of the subscleral bed, I mean, if you have complete closure of subscleral bed, it is hard to dissect it, except if you have only closure at the edges of the scleral flap. If you have closure at the scleral flap, once you enter, like if you are elevating the flap of the LASIK, once you open the edge, like what I, do, I did with this combined revision, internal and external one, once I cut the, one of the sutures, then I swept uh, around and played a little bit with the edges of the scleral flap and I elevated the scleral flap itself because it was not completely fibrosed yet. And this could be done during the first months. Later on, it is very difficult to be successful alone. And in this case, I'm, I'm doing this one and I'm starting it as if it is as a new case of fibrocolectomy, I start to give full dose of steroid. I've, you are just doing a new uh, a new trabeculectomy. If you are doing it later on, after one month, you have to inject uh, mitomycin C or 5 fluorouracil cell, and it will work well, sure. Okay, another question, and yeah. I think that will go a debate between me and you. Uh, <laughs> And Peter's anomaly and yes. with, uh, with hazy cornea, uh, corneal obesities. Uh, how trap works, and would you prefer trap or to go for tube directly? Uh, look, uh, I, 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 I like the surgery well, but I usually start with the least invasive. I consider all the tube shunts as more invasive than the trabeculectomy itself. I never resort to a primary tube surgery, despite the fact that it is proven scientifically by so many surgeons that there is some sort of primary tube surgery specifically in these cases. But in all cases, I do go for trap, and if trap fails, I try it in another side. If it fails, I go to the tube surgery. Because if you submit the patient for tube surgery like Ahmed Valve or uh, Barfeld or the Adi, the Indian one, if you, he will miss all these chances because you are dissecting a wide area of the conjunctiva and it has all the complications like closure, fibrosis, and insisted, uh, uh, I mean, 
you get incest, uh, cyst formation around the, the valve. And blood and fell in addition to the uh, the valve movement in, uh, towards the eye and uh, sutures uh, being displaced, all this complication is more drastic than the complication of the trabeculectomy. So the most important from my side, which is the debate for you for sure, is that I go for trap with uh, titrated dose of mitomycin C and play around with the uh, post-operative anti-metabolites, specifically with the steroids and the 5 fluorescent. cell. Okay, I will, I, I will keep uh, my answer for my lecture. But Please. I still have another question from the audience here about the use of uh, intra -blip blood injection or the use of uh, fibrin glue. Which filtering blips you will use this? And would you prefer them over surgical intervention? Uh, blood, uh, uh, blood injection is used for overfiltration blip, not the one with button holing. Uh, if you yeah. have a button hole, you could use uh, the fibrin glue or the, uh, the uh, cyanoacrylic glue. But the, the overfiltration blip you could use the uh, the uh, uh, the autologous blood. Okay. The um, fibrin glue uh, or the uh, the uh, cyanacrylic, but the the overfiltration clip you could use the uh, the uh, uh, the autologous blood. Okay. The, the fibrin glue or the uh, overfiltration uh, uh, autologous blood. Um, could you please mute yourself? I see a lot of people are yes. repeating the voice, and one of them was I muted one, I think. Please, uh, everyone mute uh, so only the panel uh, so we can hear each other better. Um, I think the, the question is oh, th that question, I think it, will, it, it is for me if uh, you prefer valve, which one, Ahmed or Orulab or Berbert. I'm going to answer this in my talk. Okay. Yeah. You could go okay. ahead, Dr. Tara. I want to have a quick question for you. What's your experience with, you, with using uh, glue for, let's say, um, when you're doing a, a trab, let's say you have an early post-operative leak at the limbus. Have you tried using glue for that or, or fibrin? Uh, I think it works well. Cyanoacrylate glue? Then acrylate glue uh, could ha could be used, but it is it is it is irritating a little bit. It is irritating, but mm -hmm. it, you do it except if the, if the leak is very small. Leak small. Yeah, but, but if it is large, it, for sure it will not work. You have to revise it surgically, and use mm -hmm. uh, ten O or nine O varicose suturing. Fantastic. Thank you. Yes. Good presentation. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so I'd um, like to, uh, to welcome uh, all the attendees and I'd like to thank Dr. Mohammed Mahdi and Dr. Mohammed Mellah for being with us tonight. And we are talking about uh, complications of equus shunting surgery. And it's actually a tough uh, topic and uh, usually uh, equus shunting tube surgery or equus shunting glaucoma surgery. By definition, we define them as the procedure in which a device shunts aqueous from the anterior chamber to bypass the major sites of resistance to outflow. These major sites uh, actually lies in the trabecular meshwork and endothelial lining of Schlem's canal. So we bypass these two uh, tissues and the shunt usually works by passive diffusion of aqueous into the target space. So aqueous shunts are very uh, 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 frequently now uh, used in uh, glaucoma, and there are many types of aqueous shunts. First, we have internal shunts, and we hear Dr. Mellah talking about most of the internal shunts because we can shunt aqueous to Schlenz Canal by eye stent or eye stent inject or hydros, or we can shunt also aqueous to supracoroidal space by cypass or eye stent supra or solex gold implant. 
or it can be aqueous shunting externally. So we shunt aqueous outside the eye. And externally, we can shunt aqueous to the perilimbal space. And this perilimbal space, either to the subconjunctival space, which is uh, then implant, uh, or the in focus implant, or we can shunt, we can shunt aqueous to the intrascular space like the express shunt. The other way is to shunt aqueous outside the eye, but to a remote place, which is almost near the equator. And this shunt can be divided into two types, either restricted devices like Ahmed valve, or non-restricted devices like the Maltino or the Bervelt implant. We are talking today about this equatorial or posterior aqueous shunting devices. So these are the posterior equatorial aqueous shunting devices. We call them also glaucoma drainage implants or tube shunt surgery. And we have many types. The Maltino is a prototype of this type. And the most frequently used is the Berveld implant and also the Ahmed valve. Uh, why we use shunts? Traditionally speaking, we use shunts for refractory glaucomas. And what is refractory glaucoma? It is a type of glaucoma that has a very high intraocular pressure, not controlled with the maximum conventional medical or surgical treatment, such as some kinds of secondary glaucomas, like new vascular glaucoma, epithelial downgrowth, silicon oil glaucoma, uveitic glaucoma, some glaucomas associated with other ocular pathologies like anterior segment dysgenesis, effective or pseudoeffective glaucoma, also eyes with risk factors for filtration, like young age, extensive perilimbal scarring, or repeated filtration surgery. So in refractory glaucomas, we uh, usually use aqueous shunting surgery if after two prior filled filters in glaucoma categories with good prognosis, so if we have a patient with good prognosis for trabeculectomy, we don't use aqueous shunting devices unless we had two failures or filtration failures. Or after one failed filter in glaucomas with fair prognosis, or as a primary procedure in some kinds with poor prognosis such as new vascular or uveitic glaucoma. However, we have recently a tube versus tab study, which is a TVT study, and actually it expanded, it expanded our uh, indications of tube shunts beyond refractory glaucomas. So now we are able to use tube shunt surgery in pseudophagic eyes with or without previous one failed filter, and the five-year follow-up of this study indicated that tubes and traps are similar in overall success rate, and also in the rate of visual loss, cataract progression, and even serious complications. However, the ongoing trial nowadays, they are comparing tube versus trabeculectomy for primary glaucoma without previous incisional surgery. So we are waiting for the long-term results of this trial. So we give an uh, idea about the technique of aqueous shunting surgery. First, preoperative preparations, try to assess the glaucoma status and your target pressure, assess the condition of the conjunctiva, choose the type of implant, choose the quadrant of insertion, and usually we do it superiotemporally. For restrictive flow devices like Ahmed valve, we usually check the patency and the flow through the valve. For non-restrictive devices, we have to prepare for a method to restrict flow. This is a video about a routine Ahmed glaucoma valve. We have first to do a traction suture, and then we usually do a fornix-based conjunctival flap and exposure of the sclera. And then we check patency of the valve. This is very important for Ahmed valve. And place the uh, implant superior temporally between the superior rectus and the lateral rectus muscle and then fix the implant around 10 millimeter behind the limbus. We usually 
uh, 706 suture and fix the implant to the sclera. After that, we cut the tube with the bevel up and usually have a two to three millimeter of the tube inside the AC. And by 23 gauge needle, we make the entry side, make sure that the entry side is parallel to the iris away from the cornea and don't injure the cornea or the iris or the lens while you are going inside. Then we introduce the tube inside the anterior chamber and usually it fits tight at the opening, there is no leak around it. And then we fix the tube by thin O sutures and cover it by a graft, either a fascia lata or scleral graft or pericardial graft. So this is a routine Ahmed valve surgery. How about the uh, non-restrictive uh, devices like pervent uh, implant or multi-implant? Usually these, val these devices do not have a valve mechanism. So there is a free flow of fluid. And in this case, we can get a marked hypotony. So we have to restrict the flow through these devices, either by external tube ligation, by absorbable suture, or by internal tube occlusion. So putting a tube inside, a thread inside the tube, like 4-0 per lead thread, or by doing both combined external ligature and internal occlusion. We can have a video showing a burvelled implant with both internal and external uh, uh, ligation. In burvelled implant, we usually dissect and isolate the muscles, the superior rectus and the lateral rectus muscles since the valve is large. As you see here, the, the valve is, has a large diameter and first we try to go with the uh, intraluminal thread usually 4-0 maybe silk switcher or proline thread and go inside the lumen and get outside from the valve side and this one will be externalized and we put the valve under the uh, muscles from the lateral rectus and the superior rectus and make sure it is under the muscle and then here is we make external ligation of the tube also by vicryl suture and then fix the implant we fix it routinely as we said by 7-0 suture And after that, we try to just pull the intraluminal thread and we will cut the tube with the bevel up and introduce into the anterior chamber as before. When we close this tube, actually for non-restricted devices, we may get a very high intraocular pressure in the early post-operative period. How can we overcome this? This can be overcome by either doing tube fenestrations, so we make slit incisions in the tube to let some aqueous go, so we get the pressure low, or we can do distant side trabeculectomy, or we give a maximum anti-glaucoma medications. Here is an example of a combining a burbled implant with a distant side trabeculectomy. As we see here, we inserted a four zero proline thread into inside the uh, tube of the burbled implant and now we put the implant and also we made external ligature after fixing the implant we will go to a distant side on the other quadrant and make a superficial lamellar scleral flap this patient actually had a new vascular glaucoma with uh, some kind of florid vascularization. Then we go and insert the tube into the anterior chamber and fix the tube and cover it with pericardial uh, flap or graft. And then we go back and finish the trabeculectomy. 
اتاكل الحاجات دي and we don't need uh, we need to function only for a couple of months until the valve is getting uh, encapsulated and works properly try to uh, cauterize any bleeding points so we don't have any bleeding inside and make sure that the trabeculectomy also works and you don't have a very high pressure post abruptly because now we have the trap worked in the early post abrupt period we have some situations we need to do uh, insert the tube not in the routine in the anterior chamber but we have to insert it into the ciliary sulcus this uh, situations actually occurs when we have a refractory glaucoma in eyes with corneal diseases like flux dystrophy or corneal transplants or if we have a very shallow anterior chamber with extensive synechia so uh, we can just present the example of a patient who has a uh, refractory glaucoma with penetrating keratoplasty and needed to do a purveled implant or actually this was an oral lab implant and we fix the implant and also we put an intraluminal thread and external ligature and here we measure about two millimeter behind the limbus so we make our entry site in the uh, ciliary sulcus and we will go into the ciliary sulcus and come from under the iris anterior to the IOL This patient actually also we combined it with distant site trabeculectomy. So we went to the trabeculectomy area and we did the trabeculectomy. And then we came back, inject some halo into widen the posterior chamber and guide the, uh, and I like to do, push the proline thread through the whole way in the tube so it make a stent so the tube will not be kinked during its way into the posterior chamber and it will come in position the right position you like and here starts to appear from under the iris and then we cover the tube we fix it first and cover the tube And here we can see our tube in the ciliary sulcus anterior to the IOL. Also, in some special situations, we have to do insert the, our, uh, the tube into the bars plana and vitrectomize the eyes in association with vitrectomy for specific pathology. In this case, we usually do complete vitrectomy and the tube is trimmed with a posterior bevel and we make the entry 3.5 millimeter behind the limbus and usually a bars plana clip prevents tube king so this is a clip which put on the uh, tube in ahmed valve and also found in bourbon to prevent kinking of the tube at the uh, edge of the sclera some situations in which we need to insert the tube inferiorly and this can be indicated in refractory glaucomas with silicon oil filled eye and also if there is extensive synechia and uh, superiorly here is a patient with epithelial downgrowth after complicated cataract surgery and the patient had even upper synechia and cyst so we go inferior nasally and dissect the muscles and clean the area and even put pre-placed suture and put uh, ahmed valve in this lower nasal quadrant fix it in position we only have a space here inferiorly in the uh, uh, anterior chamber we were able to insert the tube into the anterior chamber and fix it and cover it with uh, scleral uh, fascial graft now we speak about complications we have intraoperative complications uh, we have uh, the complications can be like a too large anterior chamber entry site 
if we use, for example, a, a, a large needle like a 20 gauge needle or 19 gauge needle, something like that, so we can have a leakage around the tube with subsequent hypotony. Also, we can have iris or cornea or lens damage during entry with the uh, needle. Can be also corneal entry of the tube, so the tube can go inside the uh, stroma of the cornea. There could be scleral perforations during implant fixation. Hyphema can happen, or blood around the tube, or in the ciliary sulcus insertion, you can do ciliary body separation and even bleeding. This is a kind of intraoperative complications. How about postoperative complications? We will talk about the mechanism of complications, early complications, and late complications. First of all, what is the mechanism or the mechanisms of postoperative complications of aqueous shunts? First, it can be due to poor flow control, due to lack of internal flow regulation with or without uncontrolled leakage around the tube. So this will result in hypotony, shallow AC, corridor effusion. Or due to suboptimal tissue compatibility of the implant or of the tube, and this will result in fibrous encapsulation around the implant with late failure, blip contraction, and with implant or tube migration. The third mechanism can be due to the physical effect of the implant itself on the tube. And this can result in motility disturbances, tube erosion, scleral indentation, or implant extrusion. So when we talk about early post-operative complications, we have complications that can result in excessive filtration or tube blockage, early post-operative elevation of intraocular pressure, intraocular inflammation, malignant glaucoma, hyphema, or vitreous hemorrhage. Let us uh, present some examples of these early complications. For example, excessive filtration. We know that lack of internal flow regulations, like non-functioning valve mechanism in Ahmed valve, or lack of restricting flow during a bare-valve implant, may result in marked hypotony, flat anterior chamber, like this patient here was flat anterior chamber after Ahmed valve, and we can see the tube embedded in the iris, choroidal effusions, and even subrocoidal hemorrhage. Here is a patient with Ahmed valve, and this patient had choroidal effusion, persist not uh, uh, resolve spontaneously or with medical treatment, and we have to go inferiorly in the inferior nasal quadrant, inferior temporal quadrant, and try to open on the choroidal, uh, subrocoidal space, and you can see once we reach the space, a fluid coming out, this is stroke color, the fluid is coming out to drain all the fluid in the suprachoidal space. We usually keep forming the anterior chamber or it's better to use an AC maintainer. And by slight decision with a cytodialysis spatula, don't go uh, much, just a little bit. If there is any loculation, you can have. At the end, you can just make a snap of is clear by Kelly Bunch to let uh, free uh, any fluid accumulating to uh, flow uh, freely. Uh, tube blockage can occur by fibrin or blood clot or iris or vitreous. How can we manage? There is Yag laser membranectomy. This patient has uh, iris incorporated inside the tube. Or we can do tissue plasminogen activator injection for blood clot or fibrin occlusions. Or we can do surgical cannulations. For example, this patient who had a valve and the tube and it has no good filtrations, and then we will go with the cannula and go inside the tube, and we're able to go inside the tube and inject PSS to cannulate the uh, tube and the valve. And we can see that the uh, start to get a large or elevated conjunctiva by the flow through the valve now. Also, early post-operative elevation of intraocular pressure can occur, either occur with Ahmed valve because of the hypertensive phase, or can occur with a burbled implant due to restriction of the flow. How can we manage whether to give anti-glaucoma medications, 
or to do repeated needling of the encapsulated blood with Ahmed valve, like five, uh, plus 5FU injection, or you can do removal of the intraluminal thread. Here is a patient who had a high pressure in the early postoperative period after Bervild implant. And this patient, we have to go and open on the um, tube and remove the intraluminal thread. In this patient, actually, we were using uh, ethipond, which is not a good option because it's not well seen through the conjunctiva. And we pulled the intraluminal thread outside and now we inject fluid and we've noticed that there's much fluid coming out. So we expect hypotony. So we have to go and just do external ligature of the tube. So we'll minimize the flow a little bit. Now we're checking the flow, which is less and the pressure is going better. And then we close on the tube again. Late post-operative complications. There is a long list of complications that can occur with uh, aqueous shunting devices. Long, uh, late tube corneal touch, corneal decompensations, tube migrations, conjunctival breakdown with tube exposure, motility disturbances, late failure with fibrous encapsulations, uh, cataract progression, sclera graft melting, even retinal complications like choriretinal folds, retinal detachment, hypotony maculopathy, all these complications that can happen with late, uh, with aqueous shunting devices. We will just talk about some few examples of this, the most common of which is the tube cornea touch. Tube cornea touch can occur if there is anterior entry of the anterior chamber tube, or there is long intracamular portion of the tube, or with the patient who is continuously rubbing his eyes, so he is displacing the cornea towards the tube. Actually, if you look to this, Tube. This is a good position of the tube, which is going through the angle and parallel to the iris away from the cornea. But look to this eye. This patient, almost the tube touching the back of the cornea and starting to do some corneal obesity. What are the effects of tube cornea touch? If there is constant tube cornea touch, it's actually benign because it will give non-progressive corneal epithelial loss. But if intermittent tube cornea touch will cause repeated endothelial damage and this is going to cause progressive cell loss and progressive scarring. Here is an example of a patient who had tube cornea touch with corneal uh, haze and corneal edema and we have to explant this tube and reinsert it into the ciliary sulcus. Here is the tube and we can watch the corneal obesity occurring because of the tube touching this area of the cornea. And we get the tube out from the anterior chamber and we go into the ciliary sulcus, inject, make entry site into the ciliary sulcus and we'll introduce the tube into the ciliary sulcus. So we're getting it away from the cornea and waiting for this cornea if it's going to improve or we'll go for Second complications, tube movement or tube migration. And usually tube migration can occur due to improper fixation of the scleral plate to the sclera. And this happened, for example, this tube going longer than usual, and it can go posteriorly. For example, if you can look at this valve, this implant receding back, this area is even more than or 14 millimeter behind the limbus usually you put it around eight to 10 millimeter. So it came out back and pulled the tube outside the anterior chamber. Also, we can have implant migration. Look at this patient. This is the insisted blip, which is very close to the limbus. As we see here, the implant itself migrated anteriorly. We can see this patient surgically. We have to go and remove this implant. Here is the cystic blip anteriorly and we open on this valve. This was a child, nine years old, and have a pediatric Ahmed valve. And we can see the valve and the pleb, very anterior and thick pleb actually. 
which is really also not functioning. So we excise the blip. And we get the valve. We remove the tube from the tube chamber. And it was very short also. The tube was short. So we close this opening. And we were able to open on the other quadrant. And we were able also to lengthen the tube with uh, another say, elastic tube and fix it to each other. And even we make a, a thread, a suturing it to fix it. And now we fix the new implant about 10 millimeter behind the uh, limbus. And proceed with insertion into the anterior chamber. There is another complication with the conjunctive down over the tube or the implant, which can be either tube erosion, as you can see here, the tube erodes through the conjunctiva, either because this was no uh, uh, graft or covering the tube or melting of the graft. And this actually can cause leak around the tube and if there is any infection in the conjunctiva, it can go inside the eye. Also, there could be implant erosion. This can be predisposed by mitomycin use. There is an implant eroding the conjunctiva to the surface. Here is an example of a vi video for uh, exposed tube. There is clear graft covering the exposed tube. Look to this tube, which is exposed from the conjunctiva. We try to dissect the conjunctiva from around it. Actually, it's very important to save as much as possible of the conjunctiva. And we try to dissect thoroughly all the area. And we can see that almost there's total melting of the covering graft. Now we we'll fix the tube again into the sclera and now have a scleral graft from a corneal pattern and put it and then close the conjunctiva meticulously above the implant. Also, the last one is the fibrous encapsulation around the implant. With late failure of the intraocular pressure, there is a, could be a large fibrous capsule around the implant, which can elevate the intraocular pressure. In this case, we will go and try to salvage the implant again by excising this fibrous capsule with the sixth conjunctiva, as you see here, until we reach the uh, fibrous capsule around the implant. And then we put mitomycin. So we will minimize the occurrence of fibrosis and the encapsulation. Look at this, once we open the capsule, there will be a gush of aqueous coming out, as you see, gush of aqueous. So the old aqueous trapped inside, because we had a very thick capsule and elevating the pressure. So we remove, try to uh, remove the capsule all around the implant may not be able to go as much posterior, so you don't need to open the uh, orbital fat septum. And look at this, this is the capsule, how thick and how big it is. And check now the valve is open, and then we close the conjunctiva with continuous interlocked suture, watertight, and that's it. The last complications of is the motility disturbances. The motility disturbances actually can have transient diplobia or can have permanent strabismus. This is common with large implants like the pervent implant and possible causes can be due to scarring between sclera and fibrous capsule and rectus muscles or maybe a large blip like this which can have push uh, the uh, eye down or can have fat adherence syndrome. Here is a patient with an implant and he has she has mild ptosis, as we see, and also extrovia. The treatment usually will give prism, and otherwise, if it's cosmetically uh, not welcomed, you have to go and remove the implant.
So uh, at last, how can we improve the outcome and minimize complications of aqueous shunting surgery? This can be done by, a, by a improvement in the design and the biomaterials of the drainage device itself, also accurate control over the flow restriction, and lastly, improving and controlling the process of wound healing. I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Dr. Thank you, Professor Tarek, for your valuable presentation. Now, you have a few questions I collect from the audience now. Can you stop sharing the screen? Um, it's me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, now I stopped it. Yeah, okay. uh, uh, there's a few questions for you from the audiences. Okay. Uh, number one, which valve you, you would you like? Would you prefer? Um, I prefer, of course, of, of course, uh, 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 in the preference of the uh, ease to use Ahmed valve is much easier. Yeah. To use. And Ahmed valve gives you some kind of relief in the, uh, in the early post-operative period. You don't have uh, this uh, surprises of getting hypotony, uh, and you don't need to uh, dissect through the muscles. So it's easier. But still, if you have a patient who has advanced uh, glaucoma, and you need a lower pressure, the target pressure, which is low, I think uh, the Berveld will give you a, a better lower pressure than the Ahmed valve. Uh, Berveld give more better pressure than Ahmed yes. valve? Yes. Despite the fact that Ahmed valve is valved and the Berveld is not valved? Yeah, the, the, the Ahmed valve, usually the, target, the, the pressure for Ahmed valve is in the high teens. So you can get a pressure between 18 to 20, 22, something like that. Uh, with the Berveld implant, and when you do it in the right way, so it's, you do the uh, ligature and the uh, intraluminal thread, and then you remove this thread maybe around one and a half months later, you will be able to get pressures in the low teens. So you can have a patient with between 12, 14, 15, something like that. Yeah, uh, for, for the Ahmed valve specifically, for those who are not working with the valves yet, uh, it, it, as, as far as we know from the phasing of the, uh, the intraocular pressure after valve implantation, there is a hypertensive phase during Ahmed valve. You know, yeah. are, are you willing to implant Ahmed valve? In the case of advanced glaucoma and you could get a hypertensive phase with increased intraocular pressure after valve implantation, yeah, that's 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 really a good question because Ahmed valve with advanced glaucoma was, will never give you the target pressure that you need. Um, yeah. So you don't need to expose uh, the patient with a very sick nerve to the hypertensive phase of Ahmed valve uh, unless you are uh, very cautious about the the hypertensive phase and you may need after one week to start getting the patient with anti glaucoma medications. So you will abort, abort the, the, the hypertensive phase and you will not let the patient to be exposed to these high pressure spikes. Would you wait for its occurrence or you just predict and start anti glaucoma and high, ocular hypotensive drugs before? I, I, I would prefer to, to start before starting the hypertensive phase. You mean you anticipate it and start treating? Yes. Almost, almost hypertensive phase now occurs in more than 80% of cases of Ahmed Val. Sure, this is what the beginner didn't know about, you know. That's really, that's really what, what, I, what is in my hand at least. Yeah, it is, it is related to the natural valve of the history. Uh, this is uh, the question about which valve would you prefer. Uh, I saw you that you are implanting the Barfield Bars Blana. Retro uh, iridia, right? And the serious uh, okay. Busterous colotomy. Um, ciliary in the ciliary sulcus, yes. Yeah, ciliary sulcus. Uh, 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 would you fix it with the bars blana clip or use just simple suturing? For ciliary sulcus, you don't need bars blana clip. 
But if you are going to implant in the vitreous, in the, in, through the bars plana, yes, you can do the, the bars plana clip. Yeah. The other question is, uh, what, is uh, uh, what is the length of the tube implant? You know, it's, uh, how, f how far is the length of the tube implant? Um, the length which goes inside the anterior chamber, uh, usually yeah. it's between two to three millimeter. And that's, in the serial sulcus? And the serial sulcus one? The serial sulcus, I would prefer to go a little longer, so I am able to see at least the tip from behind the iris. So I know that uh, the, the tip of my tube is patent, there's nothing going inside, the iris is not incarcerated in the tube. So I try to have the tip of the tube seen be from behind the iris. Are you afraid of the sh continuous presence of the shadow of the tube uh, uh, and the patient is always complaining that he sees the shadow of the tube? Um, I, I've never had that complaint from patients. I, you, you don't, it, it's, not going, it's not going through the pupil a long distance. It's just, just a bit to see it behind the iris. That's all. All these patients are actually advanced and uh, it is not that uh, big issue for them for the peripheral field. Um, maybe or maybe not. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, the, I mean, I've seen many of these where the, where the tube is going right to the pupillary axis and patients do not seem to notice it or be bothered by it. Um, uh, if, if it's going through the pupillary axis? Yeah, no, not, not to, but, you know, it, inside the pupillary margin and the patients mm -hmm. are not bothered by it. I yeah, know, yeah. Not through the yes. axis. Inside the pupillary margin, I have not seen an issue with that either. Okay, that's right. Yeah, I agree with you. I have another question from the audience. Uh, uh, for the cases that you revise the, the valve, uh, the, yeah. uh, the question was that uh, wouldn't you prefer uh, needling prior to you to do the revision, revision of the valve? Yes, for encapsulated blip. Yeah. Needling, yes, I prefer needling because it is a simple procedure that you can do it on the slit lamp. And I usually uh, go with needling for this encapsulated blip, maybe like three or four times. And even I inject five if, you, if it's available. And I don't go for surgical excision unless needling fails, maybe several times with me. Uh, I have another question from uh, one of the audience here. Do you, do you perform it oral lab valve in a children? Mediatric case, you mean? Um, the oral lab valve, uh, I, did, I did in two, two children, almost 11 and uh, 12 years of age, but not in kids and in infants or babies, because still oral lab does not have the, the pediatric size like the Bervold implant. Uh, Berveld has pediatric size and adult size, but uh, oral lab they don't have a pediatric size implant, unfortunately. Uh, but for Ahmed Valve, we have the pediatric size. So if I have for uh, children, uh, small children, actually, I will go for uh, Ahmed pediatric valve. Uh, there's another question from the audience here. Uh, is for the neovascular glaucoma or, and the cases with silicon. In your opinion regarding the management, what, what would you prefer? To go for which valve or you go for trap or? Um, I, wish, I usually routinely go for a valve, primary valve for new vascular glaucoma. Yeah. I, I go you for do, primary you valve. primary valve. For new vascular glaucoma. Unless the new vascular glaucoma is properly controlled by band retinal photocoagulation and anti-VGF and there is no any new vessels in the angle or in the iris. I can go with, uh, with a trap, much more sincere. Would you prefer to do this valve implantation before silicone removal or after it? Oh, okay. In silicone filled eyes, I usually keep insisting on the retina surgeon Try to remove the silicone first. Yeah. Please remove the silicone first. If he if he insists not to remove the silicone, I go for I go for a, uh, a tube. And in these cases, I usually go 
uh, with an inferior nasal implantation of the tube. And I make the, uh, actually I had a video here, but it was uh, uh, hidden because of the time. In a silicone tube I, I put it inferior with a short, a short uh, tube inside the anterior chamber. So always the, uh, the silicone will go up when the patient in the upright position and will stay away from the tip of the, of the tube. Yeah, I think I we have Professor Atiyat Mustafa was here with us now. I think if it's still available now, she is following us since we started. And Dr. Atiyat? Hello? And I will unmute her. Dr. Atiyat? Uh, Dr. Atiyat Mustafa, Ustazitna, Dimtabana, and the Owl, Dietaban, Ustazitna, Gamian. وطبعا كانت بنسال كتير عن دكتور ملاح لان احنا عندنا الملاح بتاعنا مش لازم يبقى بتاع امريكا يعني. ايوه ايوه. <تصفيق> وبعدين انا قلت لحضرتك الدكتور ملاح ده اخونا وصديقنا ده يعني راجل مفيد. لكن مش الشكل وبلاش بس. <تصفيق> المره الجايه المره الجايه هنجيب الاثنين الملاح مع بعض بس هنقعدهم بعيد عن بعض. <تصفيق> استاذتنا الدكتور عتاف دكتور ملاح دي استاذه الاساتذه مش استاذتنا احنا يعني هي استاذتنا الكبيره مقاما وعلما وخلقا وكل شيء اهلا وسهلا اهلا وسهلا شكرا شرفتنا يا دكتور عطيات شكرا ارجو ان يكون البرزنتيشنز دي فيها حاجه مفيده للناس وممكن نكون قدمنا حاجه يعني اكشولي وي هاف وي هاف دكتور شاكيب انور هي از ا كوليج اند فريند فروم باكستان اولسو كان يو اوبن He had a good question about the use of mitomycin C in valve implant and the beginning and to avoid encapsulation. I, I, hope I am muted him. You can ask him directly what he did. Ah. You can bring him into discussion. Yeah, Dr. Shakib. I'm not sure if he is still. Uh, uh, He's okay. still there. I still, he, now he, Yeah, Dr. Shakib. everybody. Alaikum salam. Nice to see you all here. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, nice to see you and nice to hear about you also. Yes. So uh, we, I, I, I always welcome you all to Pakistan again sometime. And this, uh, this time also we had planned our meeting in uh, uh, International Congress as uh, Dr. Tariq came last time. But because of this Corona problem, we had to postpone the meeting that was scheduled in the last yeah. week of April, actually. So let's hope we, we host you all uh, next time, inshallah. So uh, inshallah. Very nice to see you have been following all these lectures, very informative lectures from Dr. Al Mala and Muhammad Madi and yourself. I had a very small question that isn't it prudent to, to use uh, mitomycin in the beginning while uh, in a very uh, cautious manner while implanting uh, this valve, MF valve. So, so to prevent any further uh, blockage actually. Although we, are making yes. a, although we are making a big space and we are also afraid that it may not spread too much around, but very cautiously if we use it. Okay. Um, actually, there is still some debate about the, the, the benefit of applying uh, mitomycin C at the site of the implant posteriorly, if it helps or not in minimizing encapsulations. I, I saw a couple of papers, some say yes, it can work, some say no, it doesn't work. Mm. For my hands, I did not feel any difference. Oh. I used it several times in the past, and because I didn't feel that I got so much benefit, I stopped using them primarily as during the uh, implant. But if I have an encapsulated blip and I have to go and to remove this capsule, I put my tomycin, just hoping that it will not, it will uh, uh, inhibit uh, the fibrosis. But uh, my current practice now that I don't use my tomycin routinely with implants. Okay, all right. Yeah, 
There's another question from the audience uh, from Dr. Muhammad Khudiri for Dr. Tariq. Uh, in case uh, you are faced with a late filled tube, do you recommend trying another tube or using one of the uh, CBC's technique? Okay, that's a very good question. And actually it's, it's a tricky because it depends on, it depends on uh, your preferences. If usually you are putting a tube, maybe after the patient had one or two trabeculectomies, and then you have a tube and the tube failed, and then you have another option. Either you put a tube, maybe you don't have any space except inferiorly, or you will go for a uh, cyclophotocoagulation. Um, in this case, I would prefer to go for a cyclophotocoagulation, especially if I am going to use this kind of microbus or subliminal cyclophotocoagulations. And I will save if cyclophotocoagulation did not work, maybe I have to go for another tube. That's the, the sequence. But I would, I would go for a less uh, invasive procedure first, which is the CBC, before going to another uh, invasive uh, tube uh, insertion. Uh, are you going to implant uh, in another fresh place or you could implant in the same place again? No, you have to go for uh, a new place. You don't even need to go to extract the, the old valve, the non-working valve. Just keep it in it place. Too busy orbit. And uh, in fact, you usually start with the uh, superior temporal position, which is the preferred. And actually, the second preferred is inferior nasal. So you are away from the macula. And the third preferred is superior nasal. And the last is the inferior temporal. So these are the, the, the scenario that you can go with, with, with the tubes, uh, with the positions of the tubes. Yeah. Um, I have, I, I, read, I read a question from Dr. Uh, Amr Mahfouz. Amr Mahfouz. Um, it's written uh, privately, I'm sorry for if- uh, I don't if, have it because- uh, Because it's written privately, yes, Dr. Amr. But if you need me to, to, to answer it, um, uh, in cases of new vascular glaucoma and the PKB, you showed why you choose the non valved and temporary trap. Why not Ahmed valve? And the second question why not inserting the tube in the sulcus in the case of ICE, post phaco, ICE syndrome? Maybe this is ICE syndrome, post phaco. Uh, for the for the patient who had BKB, hmm. it was not new vascular glaucoma. It was a refractory glaucoma with BKB, but it was not new vascular glaucoma. First, and usually uh, I prefer uh, preferred uh, oral lab for this patient, uh, not uh, for a specific reason. Uh, this patient, I have him uh, about a couple of years ago when we had no Ahmed valve in the country. We spent like maybe uh, almost uh, six, seven months have no Ahmed valve at all. But Orolab was available at that time. So it was not uh, for a specific reason. For the second question, why not inserting the tube in the sulcus in the case of ICE, post FACO? I still don't understand what's ICE post FACO because I did not present ICE syndrome patients today. Uh, if, you, if you please, you can, you can explain more. Uh, I think I don't have too many questions back. I think we have to summarize the session now. Now we, are, we discussed nearly all the, uh, all the modalities of surgical treatment options and complications. Right? If you are encountered with a fresh case of glaucoma, what are you going to do for, for it first? And what is the second choice? 
especially in the glaucoma that we have, which is the high pressure glaucoma, I mean the 20s, 30s. I mean the 30s pressure, I mean. So I'm assuming you mean somebody who's, who's already failed medical management and you're looking for a first line, first line surgery. Yeah, this is, uh, yeah. So in a patient who's got open angle glaucoma, uh, pure open angle glaucoma, no other issues. Uh, they have their, their pressure is um, is high in the 20s and 30s. It would depend on what your target pressure is going to be. So if you're looking for a target pressure in the low teens, yeah. And for me personally, uh, it will be a trabeculectomy. If you're looking for if it's someone who just has uh, High pressure, uh, for example, we see patients with high pressure, their optic nerve looks relatively healthy, and you'll be happy with the pressure just in the teens, 19, 18. I think in those patients, I would do a hook dual blade goniotomy before doing a trab or a tube. Um, I think uh, I found in my hands, when we do a goniotomy, the success rate in avoiding a trab, uh, in avoiding trabeculectomy or tube, over the course of the first year is about 30%. So if you do a cook double goniotomy for uncontrolled pressure, 25 to 30% of the patients will need to go on to have a trabeculectomy within the first two years. But 70% don't, and you can just get by using a, a, a goniotomy procedure alone. Um, so for me, if a, in a virgin eye that's never had any surgery, uh, and they're already maxed medical therapy, if the target pressure is low teens, then a trabeculectomy. If we're okay with mid-teens or high-teens, then I would do a, a dual-blade goniotomy. Yeah, you mean goniotomy with the Kahok, you mean? Yes, Kahok, Kahok dual-blade goniotomy, yes. Yeah, and for the valves, if, which valve would you like to start with? The, the... Uh, once again, it depends on the target pressure. If we're okay with, let's say, if we're okay with pressure in the high-teens, I'd probably do an Ahmed valve. If we want to get low pressures, as someone with advanced glaucoma, we want to get pressure in the low tube, then I would do to meet this person. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. I don't know. So, can we uh, move the person out? Somebody or something. Mark is, uh, is trying to come into our meeting. Mark, Mark please, can you are you able to... Uh, I put him on? out now. Okay, thanks. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a, it's a spam account. Yeah. But in any case, um, so if, if it's, it depends on the target pressure you're trying to reach. So if, it's, if you're trying to reach low teens, I think I'd agree with Dr. Tartar Aid. Uh, the bare belts are going to get you lower pressures. If you don't need a pressure that low, uh, if it's someone who's just got pigment dispersion syndrome, for example, and they just have very high pressures and you're trying to get it, uh, the pressure just in the teens, anything less than 21, then I think an Ahmed tube is, is okay in those patients. Yeah, okay. Uh, do you have any questions or you see any questions from the audience now? So we'll conclude the session. Uh, actually, I'd, I'd like to uh, stress on the importance of the notes by Dr. Malah. And one of, one of the, the problems that we have here in, in our area is that we still don't have uh, plenty of MEGs to implant. But we have the Kahok implant, even not very popular. Uh, but we still uh, can manage with uh, kinds of non-penetrating surgeries like deep sclerectomy with allogen implant or viscocanalostomy, sometimes canaloplasty, uh, or even uh, goniotomy, just simple uh, traditional goniotomy. These things still can work better and still less invasive than the trabeculectomy. So if you have a mild case or moderate case, and you can go to, uh, to do a surgery for them. If you are able to do a non penetrating surgery first for this patient before you proceed with trabeculectomy, then it will help. Also, uh, we are forgetting something, I think Dr. Malah pointed out in his lecture or in his uh, discussion about the uh, selective laser trabeculoplasty. It works very well also. 
in mild cases with open angles, and you can even go with select laser trichoplasty or the SLT for every open angle glaucoma patients as a primary procedure before going to uh, proceed with an invasive uh, surgery. Uh, the trabeculectomy works very well, but still has a lot of problems. We have to, we have to know about that. Uh, so you have to be able to manage the, uh, with the trabeculectomy and all the complications or the interventions that need to be applied. Uh, the, uh, the, the tube surgery, the tube surgery now gaining more acceptance and uh, even going now to do in not only refractory glaucomas, we started to do it in uh, some patients who may be after uh, one surgery only, we can do uh, proceed with a tube surgery and do it primarily in uveitic glaucoma. I do it primarily in neovascular glaucoma and glaucoma with eye syndrome. These cases, I go primarily with tube surgery. So uh, now we have a plenty of choices for glaucoma surgeries and all this you can just make sure that you know your patients very well, you know the target pressure, you know the type of glaucoma, and you know your choices, and you will get the best choice. Excuse me, Dr. Tarek, can I have a question, please? Yes, yes, yeah, go ahead. Uh, thank you very much for all the speakers for the excellent presentations. My question to you that in the case with penetrating keratoplasty, that you did uh, post the valve and the trabeculectomy. So yeah. uh, this option was because you are expecting that tube alone were not uh, were not effective, and that's why I did the bilateral uh, ch shunts or bilateral uh, procedures. Or in that situation, it was better to do to do go for cyclodestructive procedure if you are expecting that one valve will not be enough. What's your um, opinion? Okay, um, actually, I did uh, I combined trabeculectomy with a perveled implant in this patient uh, because in the perveled implant I did internal and external ligation. So the tube of the implant is not functioning in the first month. It's almost as if it's not there. And to prevent the pressure from going up for these patients, I did a trabeculectomy. And this trabeculectomy, it is just a temporary maneuver. So I don't need from the trabeculectomy. It works only for one or two months until I go and remove the internal thread and the valve will work when there is a capsule around the implant. In this case, the implant will work without hypotony and without much lowering of the pressure. So the uh, trabeculectomy was done just as a temporary procedure to help the pressure to be controlled during the first one or two months. And even I don't go for this trabeculectomy by suture analysis or anything. I let us if uh, the patient can do massage to get, make sure that the trap is working within this month. After that, after one month, even though if the trap is started to be closed and not functioning, I don't care. I go to the, uh, to the tube and remove the thread so it works and I don't care about the trap anymore. Thank you very much. Okay, there you go. Thank you, Dr. Mohammed. Now uh, we are nearly closed. <laughs> Yeah. If there is, uh, if there is no uh, more questions, it, we have to we have to thank the audience very much. Also, yeah, we we are very thankful for them being patient with these hard complications. You know, it is not that have, one. Of the, uh, you have, you have one question about which CBC you do in your daily practice. Which you which are. CBC you do in your daily practice? Yeah. I do. Uh, um, CPC. I uh, did uh, micropass for a long yeah. time. Okay. Uh, and I found that uh, really I wasn't very impressed with efficacy. Um, <laughs> we're having a lot of people who are entering the the session. Uh, I think we're not 
Dr. Lindsay, to remove this person. I'm I think there's some hacker now. Yeah. Justin, yeah, I agree with you, Dr. Mellah, that I, I routinely now prefer to use the, uh, the yeah. microphone. Or I have yeah. also the subliminal uh, uh, threshold CBC, which is almost about almost like the microbulse, and it works much better than the uh, the old uh, cyclophosphorylation. What is that? Mm. That's Sub sublim subliminal uh, CBC. Um, I think it is uh, from Quantel. Uh, the company Quantel, and they have the subliminal or subthreshold CBC. They have the, the, the machine, it works either way. It works either by doing this pop uh, method, which is an old uh, destructive way, or by doing a subthreshold uh, uh, energy, uh, which you just go uh, uh, about like eight journeys or eight trips on the inferior and then on the superior uh, quadrant. Like the same, the way is like a uh, micro pulse and it works the same way. Okay. I've started doing now the transcleral, but I've started doing it for, for uh, four seconds uh, and with lower energy. So starting about mm -hmm. a thousand uh, to 1250 milliwatts and doing it for, for 4,000 milliseconds, uh, do an average of you know, 21, uh, 20, 21 spots. And I found that I have less uh, less uh, CME than I did with the traditional um, transcleral with the higher energy of two, two seconds. So you're using a cool laser, you mean? No, I'm using the same laser, but just a yeah, little, little has, more energy. In a, in, in a cooling effect, I mean, it's, it's not as destructive as the previous... Uh, yeah, so I don't hear the pop as much. Yeah. You have experience with the ultrasound? Ultrasound? Yeah, do you have to have it? There's a, a French one, I think. No, no, to do to do CPC. Yeah, no. it's true. It's coming. I, I have no also no no clinical experience with it. I just read about, but not. Uh, I don't have any clinical experience with that. I think it was introduced here, but it it, it the demo version was available for a limited time, but it's not available now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm, yeah, that's right. Might be it's coming or waiting for it. Well, thank you all. This was very, very nice. And uh, thank you for inviting me to speak. I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed all the questions. And it's nice to see both of you and, and to be able to discuss these cases with both of you. I would like to thank you very much for joining us, Mohammed Malah. And uh, please stay safe in, uh, from Corona and take care of yourself. And I think it's time now for you for Iftar. Yes. We, we are holding you. <laughs> uh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you it's much. nice Bye. to see you here. Thank you very much. Thank and you. And we hope much. to host you back. Inshallah. We'd yeah. like to thank all the audiences. And thank you for all the audience that waited for us this long time. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. No, okay, and okay. see you, inshallah. Thank you. Okay. Goodbye. Bye. 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 B